All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Auburn Undercover Podcast. Christian Clemente here, joined by Jason Caldwell, and joined by a special guest, Cooper Patagna, uh, Thursday edition of the Auburn Undercover Podcast. Got to remember that as we're recording on Tuesday, um, but we're going to break down a little bit of um, some of the new rankings for Auburn's commits, some of the state of Alabama guys, um, and stuff like that, and no one better to do it with us than Cooper Patagna. Cooper, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, I'm actually back home in New Orleans. My future brother-in-law is getting married this weekend and slept in my twin bed that I slept in for 21 <laughs> years right behind me. I had some I had some LSU. Uh, I, I don't even know what you would call that. I had some posters behind me. I had to take those down before jumping on with you guys. So I'm good, man. Good to, good to be home. Good to be with you guys. It's Tuesday today, so the show's coming out on Thursday, right? So yeah, day of the, day of the rankings release, man. Always, always exciting. Yeah, it's a fun time. There's a ton of, you know, I get emailed the list and there's so many new you know, top 247 newcomers, guys shifting around. It's the time of the year where everyone is moving, you know, so much in these rankings. Um, rather than me kind of butcher your story a little bit and kind of what you do, just explain to the guys, you know, what you do at 247 and kind of how you've gotten to this point now. Sure. You know, I got to ask this question the other day and it's like, it's not like that I have this, you know, written out job description. So it's kind of been one. Uh, that's evolved since I've been at the company. But originally when I got brought in, the the primary responsibilities were to really come in and, and, and kind to add some uh, structure or organization uh, and a little bit of credibility to the rankings process, especially from a, a national standpoint. And we've restructured a lot since I've been at the company and joined almost two years ago uh, in July. And obviously Andrew Ivins, who you guys are very familiar with, uh, being promoted to his role as director of scouting. I think somebody that does a tremendous job both on the reporting side and then on the scouting side as well. So uh, he's going through the process of really just trying to get his feet under him. Uh, Gabe Brooks, Chris Singletary, both those guys do a tremendous job. And then our regional analyst, uh, who we lean on a lot in the evaluation process. So for us, it's it's been finding ways to how do we get on the same page? How do we evolve with the NFL draft trends? Uh, and I think staying up to speed on, on the way the game um, is is continuing to to evolve. Like, you know, I said that earlier, but, you know, and, and I'm sure we'll get into this. You know, when we rank these players, it's in the interest of projecting their potential to the NFL draft, where they'll be selected, not the, the level of success that they'll have on Sundays particularly, but where we feel is our best educated guess. And that's exactly what it is on where we feel three to four to five years from now that they'll get drafted. Yeah, when you look at it, Cooper, that's that's probably one of the biggest questions you get when, when people go, okay, what makes a five-star guy? Um, when when you guys sit down and talk, when you go, okay, what's a five-star for you as a guy that you, you feel guys feel like would be projectable as a first-round NFL guy, right? Yeah, five-star in, in March. Uh, of the same cycle is a little bit different than a five-star in December and February. And, and people ask this all the time. It's, you know, and, and I mean this in all seriousness, when we sat down for this update, there was about six prospects that I think we were convicted on as a consensus, as a group, the four of us. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you're looking for a five-star prospect, we're looking for guys that physically first, right? The physical traits that project to Sundays that check boxes. Every position is going to have position specifics and critical factors that you're looking for and a height weight standard that we've seen in the NFL. There's years and years in data of, of successful draft trends that indicate whether or not a player is going to be successful on Sundays. Uh, and we also know that that's going to be, play a very critical part in where they're going to be selected. So it's a height weight speed game, uh, very similar to how it is for Auburn's program and how they recruit and the majority of the teams recruit in the SEC and power five conferences. So outside of the physical traits, I think for us, the next thing we, we look at is the production uh, and production is going to be different uh, with every player that you evaluate uh, in the level of competition. So that's going to be a little bit of the sliding scale there that you're going to have to take into consideration outside of that live exposure is a really critical part to the evaluation process as well. We're going to talk about the camps and the combines that we have been to recently. UA Atlanta being one of them. Gabe Brooks was just out at Under Armour Dallas. Um, and the guys that we lean on earlier in this process 
are the guys that we have more access to information to. And we're not penalizing anybody because they haven't been to any camps, but you're going to have more confidence, more conviction in the prospects that you have more information on and verified data points on. Um, so the guys that check boxes right now are going to be the guys that we're going to lean into at this point. And I want to make that different, you know, like I, I want to make that very clear, like us talking about this in March versus us talking about this in, in December or February, you know, by the time you get to January, it, it, Jason, you and I saw each other at Alabama Mississippi game in Mobile, yes. right? That's a huge exposure point. And for me, it was a huge exposure point to guys like Peter Woods, to guys like Keldrick Falk, uh, to guys like Santorin Perkins, that for a lot of these guys, it was the first time that I had gotten to see them in the evaluation process. Um, and then you talk about the All-American Bowl, you talk about the Under Armour All-American game as well. Listen, they're all-star games. And, and by that time that a lot of these guys are playing, the ink is dry, but they're still incredibly evaluable uh, evaluations for us in the process because we're not we're not structured like an NFL front office, nor do we have that level of investment, right? So for us, these live evaluations are really critical. And a lot of these guys that are in the top 32 right now in March are a lot of the guys that we've gotten to see, see early. And we're going to be able to talk about those guys. But this is the equivalent of us doing a mock draft nine months uh, before the NFL draft. A lot is going to change. The board's going to change. It's going to be fluid. And I understand a lot of people think that, you know, the grade should be stagnant and what's changed. I mean, for a lot of these guys, it's the first time that we've gotten to pop on the junior tape. This is a mass quantity of prospects that we're trying to evaluate here and cross check. So there's a lot that goes into it. It's not willy nilly. You're not just throwing mud at the wall. That's not the way it works for us right now in March. It's about getting these guys in the right neighborhood. And throughout the year, we're trying to find them the right house, you know, but right now it's about getting them in the right bucket. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's start getting into some of these guys here a little bit. One of the guys that we did get to see, um, he's Auburn's longest tenured commit in the 2024 class. Um, Amon Lane. Here's a Jason picture from uh, his days back at Thompson, actually now at Moody. Um, but we got to see him there in uh, Under Armour Atlanta. Um, rises up in these rankings a little bit from 216 to 189. Cooper, just kind of talk a little bit about what you like about him on Lane's game. And, you know, he gets a marginal bump here a little bit, just kind of what got him that bump and kind of what do you see out of him at the next level? Well, we got to see him live in Atlanta, and obviously you guys were, were at that combine. But I think, you know, versatility, I think he's he's built stout. Um, I think he tested adequately uh, sub-4-7 guy. He was a sub-4-4 four, four guy in the shuttle, but lower body explosive. I think this is a guy that kind of reminded me frame-wise of a guy like Buda Baker that we had at Washington when I was there. And I think he's probably going to end up evolving into a nickel safety role. Uh, he's physical. I like him better on tape than I do the athlete. Uh, but there is some some redeeming qualities there in terms of the physical traits. So I think he's a football player. Like I said, I like the versatility. I think he can play off the hash. I think he can cover in the slot. And I don't think he's afraid to stick his head in there as well and run support. So I think he is a guy that kind of fits what you're looking for in the SEC, physical nature, player, explosive, plays bigger than his size at five foot ten. But those are some of the reasons that we liked him. Yeah, uh, let's talk a little bit about Jaden Lewis. Kind of, um, he gets bumped down a little bit. You know, that stuff kind of happens around this time of the year. Of course, Auburn fans will be like, "What's going on? How did he? You know, how did he drop down?" Um, but things get shifted around a bunch. Um, I think we're higher on Jaden Lewis than even still a lot of other sites are. And um, same with Amon Lane. Um, Jaden Lewis is Auburn's – we've listed as a cornerback. Um, Auburn is recruiting him more so as a safety now um, and has him committed to play safety. But, Cooper, what do you kind of – what do you see out of him? Yeah, I think they're on it there. You know, like I, I, I talked about this with Amon Lane, but the more you can do, the more value that you add, right? And what I like about Jaden Lewis, I mean, you're talking about a guy probably floating around six feet right? Six feet plus and mm -hmm. sub 10, eight, uh, excuse me, 10, eight, 200 meter. Also has got really good 200 meter context. And people probably wonder why we talk about that fast is fast. Verified speed is really important, right? There's a difference between play speed and time speed. And I think the biggest thing for Jaden Lewis is that we have that on our record. Now, why might he have dropped I'm too much into it, especially on the back end. Uh, but the versatility is there. And then certainly, uh, no questions asked on my behalf whether or not, you know, Auburn sees him as a safety. I think that is a, a pure projection of what he's going to be 
at the next level. But we talked about the versatility. You want to build guys with multi-positional value and positional flexibility. That's how you add value on the back end of your secondary. And I think a guy like this not only has the size, but he checks checks boxes in terms of speed and athleticism. That's going to be a guy that you can really count on and develop. I don't think he's going to be a day one ready guy. Maybe you can contribute on special teams earlier. But this is the type of guy you get in your program, you develop, and you don't know where he's going to be three to four years from now, especially if he's got the physical clay that he has. Yeah, Cooper, you, you've been in from the college side of things, from in actual programs. You've mentioned versatility with both Amon and Jaden. NFL, it's a big deal. How much has that changed in terms of evaluating guys because of that, because of now the need to have the nickel guy, because most defenses now, probably 80%, they're in nickel. That guy's on the field all the time. Right. A lot of these guys aren't in base anymore. Right. So you're, you're playing more bases, more playing more with five defensive backs. Right. Mm -hmm. So that versatility is 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 huge. And you want to be able to play to the player's strengths as well. So a guy like Jaden Lewis, you know, like I've referred to earlier, but his capability is also very he's comfortable in man to man as well. We talked about the slot defender, the way that you could really compliment a guy like Amon Lane and Jaden Lewis. I think that flexibility is huge. It's always been a, a critical part of the evaluation process. And for the coaching staff, it's more of a, it's a it's an insurance policy, right? right? It's the same way on the offensive side of the ball when you're recruiting offensive linemen. Connor Lou was one of those guys, right? We were talking about it before we jumped on here. And, you know, I apologize for segue into to the offensive side of the ball, but Connor Lou strictly played center in high school. Right. And I asked you guys where he's been working out during the spring and you said, all right, he's cross training at center and guard. The value that Auburn gets from a guy that can cross train and play multi positions on the offensive line now is considerable instead of one guy saying, hey, we're going to pigeonhole him at the center spot. And if he can't get it done there, then there's no there's no additional value that he can add anywhere else on the offensive line. It's the same sentiment when you're talking about the defensive back room, right? If Mon Lane can't cut it playing the deep hash, what's next for him? you got to be able to project the secondary position. That's really important. Um, so I think the good thing with both these guys is, is that they're multi-positional secondary defenders, that both of them are physical players that have showed a toughness to also contribute on special teams. So I think these are plus-plus early evals for Auburn. They're not headliner evals by any stretch of the imagination. Sure, they're both top 250 prospects, but they're developmental players. And you build your floor, you build your program from the ground up with these type of guys. These are the guys that aren't going to steal headlines, but this is going to be the foundation of your roster. You got to get these guys, especially when they're in state. Yeah, let's talk about one guy that kind of will get some headlines, certainly at least with Auburn fans. Um, we'll talk about him just a little bit because he's outside of your footprint a little bit um, from Little Rock, Arkansas there. Walker White, Auburn's quarterback commit. He gets bumped up from 91 to 77. Um, so honestly, a pretty impressive bump. You know, he's got he's got a lot of good traits. Um, Cooper, we talked about a little bit beforehand. He's only completed 54% of his passes um, the past two years starting. He does have 21 interceptions combined those two years as well. Um, so a lot of good traits and then some things you'd like to see improved. Um, this is a guy who I think Elite 11 could be a good opportunity for him, obviously. Um, and then I think the senior year film is probably the biggest thing um, for him. Cooper, I'd love to hear kind of your thoughts there. But can he show some improvements in accuracy, limit the turnovers a little bit there? Um, and then maybe, you know, I don't know if he could – it's it's getting into five-star range is probably out of his range at 77 right now. But maybe top 50 would be where I would say he could maybe peak, um, I think. So I'd be curious kind of – just your thoughts there on him. This quarterback class, and I'll for Auburn fans, what I'll do is I'll try to illuminate a broader vantage point of the quarterback position right now. It's it's very different than the 2023 20, crop, which was very top-end talent heavy at the top. Obviously, you had guys like Arch Manning. You had guys like Nico Iamai Lieva, Dante Moore, Malachi Nelson, Jackson Arnold, so on and so forth. I mean, it was littered uh, with – you know, five quarterbacks that we had inside the top 32, which I think most years would make you feel a little bit hesitant. That number right now is only two, right? And there were a lot of conversations. Do we even have two outside of Dylan Rayola? You know, we thought there was a chance Jaden Davis might not end up as a top 32 prospect. And at the end of the day, I'm not sure if there's going to be more than one guy standing 
when we get to our final rankings in, in December or February. So point being is there is a small crop of players that we have circled outside of the 32 that we feel are wild cards. Walker White fits into that conversation, right? I mean, from a physical trade standpoint, which I talked about is the most important part of the process for us right now. In May of last year, 6'3 and a half, 217. He's got a 6'5 wing. He's got a 35 inch vert, a 4'2'2 shuttle. He's got 10 and a quarter hands. This is the type of guy that would walk into the NFL combine right now in Indianapolis and he'd turn a lot of heads, right? And then in terms of the, the, the arm talent and the arm strength, it's there. And I talk about this a lot with a lot of players that might be able to throw the ball a mile, but it's the nuances of the game, right? It's timing, touch, it's anticipation. It's being able to play within yourself. You talk about that high turnover rate. And a lot of that stuff might have a little to do with mechanics, typically footwork. I mean, you you see the conversations that surround a guy like Anthony Richardson right now. A lot of NFL teams are so fascinated by Anthony Richardson because they feel when the feet are right, he's a different player, right? Can you coach that up? It was very much the same type of logic that surrounded a guy like Josh Allen when he came out of Wyoming. So you look at a guy like Walker White, coming out of small ball Arkansas, there's a lot of room and a lot of development for a guy like him. And I think the ceiling, I think the floor of what you're looking at with a guy like Walker White is probably a top 100 prospect, which we would call a day two NFL draft choice. Uh, And the ceiling for him is, I mean, if, if you were lights out this year, and what I mean by that is not only on the field, but when we had the in-person evaluation, which he was one of my favorite guys when I saw him last year, in Nashville at the Elite 11 Regionals. I mean, he's going to impress in that type of setting. I do think this is a guy that can sneak into the conversation of being closer to 32 than to 50 because I think he's got those type of traits. Um, And listen, Walker White was a really coveted player when Auburn was able to get him in the boat. Um, I like Walker White a lot, uh, and regardless of where we have him ranked, I feel fairly confident that he can end up being one of the best quarterbacks in this cycle. Yeah. Uh, Let's transition to some in-state guys. Um, Some of the big risers here. Um, One of our favorite guys, Jason, and I's favorite guy over uh, central Phoenix city. Let me get rid of this overlay here at the top. So you can see him catching that pass. Oh, and it just switched to swamp two, four, seven. Okay. Uh, There's interesting little mix there on (laughs) stream yards, but uh, um Cam Coleman, guy that we really like um, and a guy that you guys like as well, jumps up from 189 uh, to 21 there. So kind of in that five-star range right now after just an incredible show in there um, at Under Armour Atlanta. Yeah, I really, you know, you look at the production and the pedestrian, uh, excuse me, the production is, it, it doesn't blow you away by any means. Uh, but Cam C- Coleman is a guy that we kind of had asterisk for, for quite some time because we knew physically he was different. Uh, you see him in Atlanta and it was one of the first times that, you know, we had Andrew Ivins in attendance. We had Brian Thorne in attendance. So it was good to get some, some additional eyes on, on Cameron Coleman, but just in terms of the physical makeup, it's elite. And, you know, you look at him, he's six, three and change. He's 180 pounds plus he's built very well. He clocked a four, four, eight at that event. He also had a four, one, nine shuttle and he almost had 11 foot broad, right? So you take in the top end speed with the leaping ability, the natural ball skills. I do think he's going to be a little bit limited in terms of the route tree. He's not really an in breaking receiver by any means. This is a guy that's a vertical explosive 50, 50 pass catcher. Um, and he's a sight to behold when you get around him physically, uh, kind of a basketball player type of feel to him, plays above the rim. And when it comes down to the physical traits, this was a guy that we felt really, really comfortable betting on. Um, and you go back to the tape, there was enough there that made us feel really confident getting him into the top 32. And there's a really strong receiver crop at the top. You know, it really, really starts with guys like – Jeremiah Smith, Ryan Wingo, Bryant Wesco is another guy that just ballooned up the board for us. But Cameron Coleman, you know, we're looking to fill out that top 32. And like I said, what you allude to typically is like, all right, who are the guys that have really impressed us physically? Checkbox there. And then the live evaluation in in Atlanta, certainly back that up. And then you go to the film, there's enough to like uh, where you're not even really talking to yourself into the conversation of putting them in the top 32 is a pretty easy decision. But by the end of the day. 
Yeah, I think you kind of look at Cam Coleman. Um, Jason, we were at the game, you know, IMG Academy. Um, Cooper, I don't know if you've seen the clip. He catches a pass, breaks probably about eight tackles. Yeah, it was um, a bunch. It was one of the most absurd plays. And from that point on, um, went to go and see him, I think, two more times later that year. Kind of felt like the light turned on a little bit. You know, he was still behind Carmelo English. Um, but from that point on, it kind of it really clicked with him. He really realized kind of what he could do. Um, one of the next games we saw him play was against Auburn High. And he jumped out of the building to catch a pass. It was absurd. Um, but yeah, you're right. And, and Cooper, you're talking about um, development, development for prospects. And that's one thing you, you don't know when that when that light's going to click on. We were talking about Keldry Falk earlier, and it almost happened in that Alabama Mississippi practice. Like it, it changed, carried over to San Antonio, and now it's carried over to Auburn. And that's the one of the things that you look at sometimes you, you, and that's why you have to kind of lean on sometimes numbers, athleticism, because you don't know when exactly, because some guys develop earlier and they have that instinct when they're freshmen in high school. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Well, you know, the interesting part is you, it's hard. And I, and I get this from a fan standpoint as well, right? You want to evaluate the player and that's important, but you got to remember, I mean, these guys have three to four years of development before they reach the pinnacle of their collegiate career and are going to be draft eligible, right? So with a guy like Cameron Coleman and a lot of these other players that we have in the top 32 and one through 247, the way we see it is we want there to be enough on tape to match what we've seen physically, the capability of what's in their body. You're really evaluating the athlete more than the player at this stage of their career. There are a lot of really good football players out there that will never be able to obtain the type of athleticism that a guy like Cameron Coleman has. Cameron Coleman to us is just scratching the surface of what he's going to be one day. And we talk about the production, right? I mean, at over 500 yards receiving, but I mean, you refer to the IMG game. That was big, right? Because on, on the defensive side of that ball, it's, it's Desmond Ricks, right? Who ended up being a top 40 player for us. And was one time a five star before he reclassified, and then Ellis, or excuse me, Ellis Robinson, who's a top five player in the country for us right now in, in 2024, and the number one cornerback in the country. He's heading to Georgia, right? So, seeing him be able to uh, flash in those type of environments and those type of games and in those type of settings is really important for us. We just want to know that it's in there, mm -hmm. and then that level of consistency can get developed over time and. <laughs> Obviously, the verified data points are, are a really big sticking point for us. Uh, we're not going to put a guy in the top 32 blindly if you test the way Cam Coleman tested, it, but can't play ball. You got to be able to play ball first. And then the supplementary data points got to add a little bit more uh, to the overall picture. And this is a guy that we felt really, really confident about. And, you know, you look at the board, you look at the top 32 and it's like, I mean, do we have this guy too low? You know, so I'm, I'm really excited for his senior year because without a doubt in the majority of these guys, their best football is ahead of them. Like you said it, he, he's only starting to figure it out, play with that confidence. And he, he played with the most confidence I think I'd ever seen him in Atlanta. Like, yes, he played to his size and to his athleticism there. And I thought he was one of the best players in attendance. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about one more big riser here. Uh, Jordan Ross, you know, very, you want to talk about a guy that's extremely athletic um, at the edge position um, or at the jack linebacker, as Auburn calls it. It's Jordan Ross. Um, this is Jason. I go in to see him play basketball, and that's kind of a good grip on his athleticism. And we saw it. We saw it at Under Armour Atlanta. Um, freak athlete. He'll obviously need to add some weight. I think he's around 215 right now. So he'll need to add some weight um, once he gets to the next level. But we bumped him up a lot from 81 to 12. Um, and Cooper kind of what have you guys seen out of him and what do you like about him so much to where he does get that huge, huge boost? The question mark is production, right? Um, you, you look at a guy like Jordan Ross and you think, all right, this has got to be a double digit sack guy. That's certainly not the case with him, but you look at his background, two sport athlete, basketball as well. When he came to Atlanta, you know, my expectations were tempered because I just didn't know what to expect in terms of the frame. And he was a little bit lighter on the top half than I thought. But in terms of the way that he's built throughout the lower half, uh, it was certainly encouraging. What I mean by that, I mean, he came in at six, four and a half, 215 pounds. There's a lot of edge 
three, four stand up outside linebackers that we like that are closer to 200 pounds than they are to 220. So to see him with a six foot eight plus frame, 35 and a half inch arms, which give or take there, let's say they're one inch off, 34 and a half inch arms is still elite, right? Uh, and then to go look at the testing, I mean, he, he ran he ran a four six eight, right? And he had uh, a four four nine shuttle. And then just seeing him move around, I mean, the agility, the athleticism, the ability to get in and out of breaks, the, the ability to bend the edge. I mean, this is a guy from a quick twitch explosive standpoint. He is a nightmare for opposing offensive linemen to figure out how to game plan for. Uh, he's he's different, right? Three, four stand up outside linebackers, depending on your scheme, come in a lot different shapes and sizes. But this is a typical one that, you know, I think he has some off ball ability as well. Now, I think the, the thing that he does the best is rush the passer. But if you get in some certain passing down situations, he's also a guy you feel pretty comfortable with dropping with situationally as well. So we love his developmental upside as a pass rusher. This is a little bit of us saying, you know what, we're going to hedge our bet a little bit. We're going to push our, our chips into the middle of the table. And we think this is going to be a guy that's going to play himself into this into this grade range rather than this is where he is right now. I expect him to take another leap going into his senior season. I think we saw that in Atlanta. I also thought he had a really solid junior year as well. Might have not showed up in the stat sheet, but in terms of what you see on tape, there's plenty there enough that you feel really confident in the player. So this is going to be a guy that's going to play his collegiate career around 240 pounds. Like I said, I love the versatility. And I think the first step explosiveness – I think where he needs to get better is at the point of attack, being a little bit more consistent, playing the run. And right now, uh, he's such a dynamic athlete. He can get by with just his speed and quickness. But once he develops a full repertoire of pass rushing moves, I think this is going to be a guy that's obviously going to be a no-brainer. Uh, and he's one of our favorite, not just athletes, but favorite all-around players in the top 247. I'm really personally bullish on this kid. Have been for a while. Love the tape. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to compare him to this player, but in terms of the rise, I think it was kind of Yonsei Pierre-ish. Uh, but we had more on Jordan Ross at this point in terms of verified data points than we ever had on Yonsei Pierre. Yeah. You know, we Yonsei, Yonsei Pierre, it was like we showed up to Mobile and it's like, okay, this we need to reopen the book on this cat because, you know, at that point we just didn't know that much about him. Uh Jordan Ross going to these combines, performing at the level that he has against the lead level competition has certainly helped in terms of our confidence getting him into the top 32 at this point. Yeah, and, you know, he's a guy that first year head coach last year, um, a defensive guy, Robert Evans, takes over at Best Davy Heels where he played. And so year one in a system, two-sport guy, you're right. You, this is one where you, you would expect to see a big-time jump in his senior year as he's more comfortable in the defensive scheme and also – those coaches knowing what he can do um, will help probably put him in a better position too. He's uh, he's fantastic. I mean, there's, there's every year you got a little bit of a scouting crush. Jordan Ross is, has, has been my guy, obviously Cameron Coleman as well. And like I said, it's not, it's not a coincidence, right? These guys that we've gotten to see live. I mean, we want to know the players that can do it. And the other part of this, when you get in the top 32, we know the top 32 is going to change. And right. this is the earliest we've ever done it. It's the earliest we have. And, and this is good context for the listeners out there. In 24-7 sports history, we have never assigned 32 five stars as early as we have now. So that's going to change. And, and just like the evaluation process is fluid. Um, and what we wanted to do with that, we wanted to be a little bit careful. And we wanted to make sure, all right, even if these guys don't live up to our certain level of expectation, we want to make sure the bottom doesn't fall out. You don't want to look at Jordan Ross and all of a sudden he's 12 in March. And then you get, you get to the middle of October and he's sitting there at 220. right? <laughs> that's a, that's a complete miscalculation for us. The confidence in Jordan Ross is not only he checks boxes from a height, weight, speed standpoint, but he's at a premium position as well, right? He's a three, four stand up mm -hmm. outside linebacker. These guys get paid and they get taken early uh, in the NFL draft because of the upside at the position. Pass rushers are very difficult to find. So guys like Jordan Ross are going to get the benefit of the doubt. I can't see him 
in any world realistically falling outside of the top 75. Now I might be coming back on with you guys in, in December and eating my words here, but I love this kid. I think the arrow is, is pointing up um, and hopefully he can really mature into the player that we think he can. Yeah. We're at the 30 minute mark. We'll do one last one kind of rapid fire here. Um, Cooper, I'm going to have you pick between two running backs. I mean, I think I'll know the answer here because one is ranked higher um, by about 40 spots. Kevin Riley from Tuscaloosa County, they're at 112 now. Um, and Andalusia's running back, Jamarian Burnett, at 153. Here's Jamarian Burnett, obviously. Very, very different frames between him and Kevin Riley, very different play styles. Um, but kind of who do you – I mean, Kevin Riley's rated higher, but kind of what do you see out of both those guys and who do you project kind of better at the next level? That's a great question. I thought you brought up a, a really good point there between the frames. The frames are different. The running style is different. You know, the, those two backs really couldn't be any uh, a little bit more different. I think Kevin yeah. Riley has got a little bit more wiggle to him and elusiveness in the open field. I mean, I think this is a guy that can be a three down running back. I got to see him in Montgomery a couple months ago. I like his frame and I, the growth potential there as well. I think the arrow is pointing up. Hard part on Kevin Riley that is kind of keeping a, or, or keeping a ceiling on him right now is the fact that we just don't have any additional live exposure or live verified testing. So there's no track and field. There's a lack of multi-sport data. Uh, and on top of that, there's not a lot to go off other than the tape, which we really like a lot. You know, when I first watched him, I caught, I, I thought a little bit about Brian Robinson. And I'm sorry to keep bringing up, you know, Alabama Crimson Tide comparisons on here, but that was kind of the comp of what I thought. Jamarian Burnett, to me, not to take anything away from him, is a guy that I don't know how much more physical upside there is in his game. And I can see him kind of being uh, a back that contributes in a stable of backs. I think that's kind of his running style. Inside runner, very physical, uh, a guy that in terms of contact balance, he gets downhill in a hurry. Uh, and there's a lot of production there. I think this is going to be a guy that's going to play. Uh, in the FCC and a guy that's going to be relied upon heavily. I just think it's going to be more in a change of pace role. Uh, and I think Kevin Riley's probably got more upside as a guy that you would see in the lens of more of a, of a three down back. Um, but I think Jamari and Burnett, if he gets into the right system, is definitely going to be a guy that is going to be a high level contributor at the next level, but more of a guy we see in, in that day three range than rather than that day two range. Yeah, no, I would agree with that completely. Um, just from seeing, I haven't seen Kevin Riley in person, but Jason and I saw Burnett play against uh, Montgomery Catholic, Jeremiah Cobb earlier in the year. Um, I, will, I, will, I will say this. I'll end on this. Um, if there's one position that I think gives us the most fits, it's running back, right? Because a lot of these positions, receiver being one of them, you look at guys like Cameron Coleman, and it's easy to see the trajectory of these type of players, not only from a physical clay standpoint but when you see him over the offseason and when you see him at the combine you start to see him you start to see the wheels turning a little bit these guys starting to put it together the running back position is so subjective i mean there are multiple hall of famers that did not run four six right mm -hmm. at the running back position and you think about that and what's the most important traits when you look at the running back position you know some would argue that it's vision and it's burst well, those are really subjective not really quantifiable, right. right? Everything else, we got a roadmap, right? What's his 10 second split? What's his 40 yard dash? What's his short, short area changing, uh, change of direction? What's his ability uh, to get vertical quickly? All those you can quantify and you can put in a quantifiable metric. The running back position has a lot more to do with feel and with instinct, Correct. Uh, which is not something that you can put a number by and assign that to. So you know, really beauty is in the eye of the beholder when it comes to the running back position. And we've had multiple guys in the last two years that have really fluctuated up and down the board because you see some gaudy numbers in terms of what they've done, maybe in track and field, what they've done in terms of verified testing. And then you watch the tape and they just do not have the feel for the position. It's not the same, right? Um, so that feel for the position is really important. Um, and that's something that we got to make sure every time we're watching running backs, really linebackers too, more traditional four, three, um, off roll linebackers that, Hey, we're looking for guys like football instincts. Uh, and obviously we want these guys being able to run and, and check boxes in terms of athleticism. But when you compound that with, you know, the, the football instincts and the vision and the feel, that's when you, you feel 
a lot more confident about the players. So Jamari and Burnett might not light it up from what we're looking for from an athletic or from a speed standpoint, but in terms of the fo- pure football player at the position, there's a ton to like there. Yeah, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, Cooper, thanks for hopping on. This was uh, this was really informative, not only for me, hopefully for everybody listening as well. Uh, people always ask me whether it's recruits, fans, whatever. They're like, you know, "What goes on in the ranking process? You know, what are you guys looking for? Stuff like that." I'm like, uh, "I don't know. I just I watch football. Um, and I'm very much that. Oh, he's got that dog in him. You know, that that looks like a football player out there. Um, but obviously, there are much smarter people doing a lot more in depth. Um, the actual process is a lot more in depth um, and a lot more complex and complicated, which I'm glad I'm not involved with because it would be a disaster if I was. Well- uh, let me leave, let me leave you with a like little antidote here. Like, it's an imperfect process. People think this is a math equation. It's not. It's imperfect. It's an evaluation process. It's more. It's more like art than it is like math. You know, there's no two players are the same. Maybe physically, there's going to be a lot of similarities, but what's between the ears as well is going to be completely different. There's another part of this process subjectively that the NFL invest millions and millions of dollars each 30, each of the 32 teams does. And they still get it wrong. They still get it wrong. They they still get it wrong. You know? So for us, you have to adopt the mentality of we're not going to get all these guys. Right. I put my head on the pillow. Like you and I were talking earlier, like both of you guys were talking. It's like, yeah, I have no idea what's going to happen with Peter Woods. You know, we got the Clemson fans saying, hey, this guy should be ranked higher because Dabo Sweeney's coming out of his press conference and saying, you know, he's he's further ahead than uh, Christian Wilkins was. And it's like, yeah, he he might be, you know, that's that's kind of where we thought we knew he was going to turn heads early. But at the end of the day, we get judged where these guys get drafted. Right. So there's a little bit of a fluctuation where you got to balance. Hey, like a guy like Quinshawn Junkins, you know, who I can tell you right now I missed on. You know, we had as an 87 overall ranking, uh, 87 overall rating, excuse me. But what happened there is, you know, you look at it and I look back and I'm like, all right, what did I I get wrong about this kid? And I overvalued a negative and overlooked the positives. And what I mean by that is, you know, Judkins didn't really run well uh, in terms of what we had in terms of verified testing and track and field data. And this was at the position I was just talking about. It's running mm-hmm. back, but he had yep. excellent instincts and feel. And then on top of that, he was a really strong runner with really good balance and body control. Yeah. And that's his game. And system uh, fit. System right. fit for running back, too. It's, it's huge. And, and the other part is, look, 38 yards is great. 18 yards is really good, too. You know what I'm saying? Uh, not every play is going to be uh, a home run hit. So this is one where – you talk about the evaluation process. It's all about refinement and constantly fine tuning your process and reevaluating where you went wrong or maybe what you saw different, but you know, the same things are always going to elevate guys for us. And, you know, we talk about checking boxes, man, that's the name of the game for us. You got to have height, weight, speed, you got to have production. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, multi-sport athleticism, track and field background, those are all proven indicators of success that is not something we are leaning into just because we've heard it uh through the grapevine one day those are all things that over time are statistically proven uh as successful draft trends um so that's what we lean into it's imperfect and i don't i don't pretend to sit up here and have every answer and be 100 110 percent convicted on every player uh and anybody that tells you that they are you know they're just they're full of it, in my opinion. You know, we we do the we do the best we can, and, and you live with the results, and you just kind of live and you learn. I mean, that's that's kind of the attitude that you got to take into it. Guys, if you want a better better look at this um, weekly, make sure you guys go and check out Cooper and Andrew Ivans with their podcast, um, the twenty four seven Sports College Football Recruiting Podcast. They've got that um, more of a national look, and it's a great opportunity to get a kind of a weekly look and behind the scenes in this and. They've had special guests on. Uh, Cooper, who was the last one? It was Ohio State. Uh, I'm forgetting. Yeah, we had uh, Ohio State's uh, associate AD of player personnel, uh, Mark Pantone, who was really, really great. And listen, even if you're not an Ohio State fan, I think that's a really good peek behind the curtain uh, of just trying to jump into the mind of what it's like to 
oversee a program like Ohio State. And this is a guy that worked. I, I mean, he's going on year 12 there, right? So he's worked for Urban Meyer. He's worked for Ryan Day. He's kind of been in the middle of that transition. They do an incredible job. I think every team in the country, even when I was at Washington and at Oregon, you're striving for that type of continuity, right? And that type of alignment on the recruiting trail. So he's done a great job, man. We got uh, we got Willie Fritz, head coach of Tulane, jumping on tomorrow. Uh, Kalen DeBoer, head coach of Washington, the week after that. Hopefully, Gus Malzahn, the week after that. Uh, a name that uh, Auburn fans are really familiar with. And hopefully, we can get Hugh Freeze on there when the time's right. So um, we're we're trying to build the trying to build brand awareness through the uh, credibility of our guest, you know, which I'm, I'm sure is, is definitely uh, we just something did, that's been, we just been did the same before. thing. So that's good. So. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. No, thank you, Cooper. Hopefully we'll do this again, maybe towards the end of the cycle again. I think that'll be good and have more Auburn commits to actually kind of run through a little bit, but I think this is really good. And I think personally, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so I know a lot of Auburn fans are going to enjoy it as well. Um, so this is really good. Um, guys, if you're listening on Apple, Google, Spotify, whatever, make sure to leave us a review there. Um, if you're on YouTube, if you're not already subscribed, it's free. Um, like the video as well. Um, we'll have more podcasts and more spring practice content out this well as week um, over at AuburnUndercover.com. So check us out there. Make sure you check out Cooper as well. Um, and we'll catch you guys soon.